All right, so um, <laughs> before we begin, uh, in terms of logistics, the event's been recorded. If you're following us uh, online or you want to share comments online, we're using the hashtag ITIF encryption. Uh, the goal of today's event is to explore the ongoing debate about cryptography and how to find the right balance between what we hear about the government and law enforcement wanting to prevent crime and fight terrorism, and on the other side, the, the need of businesses and individuals to protect their data. Um, to start off this conversation, I'm uh, delighted to introduce Representative Del Beni. Uh, Representative Del Beni represents Washington's first congressional district. Before running for Congress, she was a successful technology entrepreneur and business leader. Uh, and over the past few years, she's emerged as one of the most important uh, voices on technology policy issues in Congress. Earlier this month, uh, Representative Del Beni reintroduced the Encrypt Act, uh, which would present, preempt state and local governments from passing laws uh, that would limit access to encryption technology. Uh, Representative Del Beni, uh, thank you for your leadership on these issues, and thank you especially for agreeing to share your thoughts with us this morning. Good morning. Um, and thank you, Danielle, I appreciate it. Um, this is a really important topic, so I'm glad we're, you're all taking the time to discuss it. Um, I think, um, you know, definitely having worked in the technology sector for many years, I know how important discussions like this are because it's a complicated issue and people need to have these discussions and learn about what technology can and cannot do um, to make sure that we're putting the right policies forward. Um, now, I was also a member of the encryption working group that we put together the last Congress to address issues that came up after the San Bernardino case. Um, the most important thing that came out of that final report, and this was a bipartisan report, was that any measure that weakens encryption works against the national interest. Um, that is, I think, an important consensus that we had and speaks to this ongoing dialogue about having backdoors or backdoor access. Um, I think we agreed that that is not the policy we should pursue. Um, as Daniel mentioned, I'm also a co-sponsor of the Encrypt Act with my colleague, um, Representative Liu, to make sure that we come up with um, federal policy on these issues. Um, but we still have a lot of work to do to help people understand these issues and um, to understand that backdoors are bad for security. Um, now with Jeff Sessions at the DOJ, the challenges that we face have only grown. Um, we have a president whose understanding of technology seems to so stop at 280 characters. Um, it's not exactly surprising that we still can't move beyond this idea of potentially mandating backdoors or what is now called warrant-friendly encryption, um, which might sound nice, but I think any technologist will tell you that it's really a sugar-coated way of saying we're gonna leave a key under the doormat. And with innovation happening the way it is so quickly today, um, I'd say it's even more like leaving a key on the doorknob with a, with a bright neon bow on it. Um, it's really about inviting bad actors to steal information that would hurt our citizens, hurt businesses, and hurt our national security. So it's hard to overlook the fact that the problems that we as a society are facing seem to only grow in complexity each passing day um, with a lot of change and innovation. Um, the First and Fourth Amendment at times seem to be under assault with no end in sight. And it's at times like these where it's incredibly important that we defend the values that we hold dear. Um, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that the encryption debate that we're having today is wrapped up in all of these deep questions about who we are as a people and what kind of democracy we wanna live in. Um, many of you know that the Department of Justice Office of the Inspector General found that the team responsible for unlocking the iPhone in the San Bernardino case did not consult with third party vendors or relevant FBI offices, including the unit that already knew of a potential solution. So rather, it appeared that there was an intention to not pursue real solutions because people saw an opportunity to force a lawsuit, um, a lawsuit against Apple and a path to backdoors. That is not, that is not how we should be doing things, particularly as a global leader in innovation. We need to lead by example, and we need to make sure that U.S. companies are free to develop the most secure, 
most advanced products in the world. And given the opportunities ahead, uh, making sure that we are protecting and promoting encryption has never been more important. And I'm heartened today to see ITIF and everyone of you that are here today um, showing leadership in this conversation. So um, thank you so much for allowing me to speak for a few minutes. And I'm happy to take a few questions um, if we have time beforehand. Great, thanks. And we have a mic. So if you just raise your hand, we'll, we'll take a few questions and we'll be into the panel discussion. And well, I'm going to have a question to start uh, it off, <laughs> definitely. Um, and I'll, I'll open it up to our panelists, too, because I, I suspect they will as well. Um, I wanted to know if you could talk about um, the prospects for your bill. Because you know, last year, we did see a number of state governments start looking at you know, specific measures that would um, you know, do the one state solution for encryption. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it looks like this kind of thing is actually very necessary. Do you have any thoughts on? Um, it's hard right now in terms of building support to get legislation like this passed. I, I hearken back to a, a very simple piece of legislation that we still struggle to pass to kind of highlight the challenges that we face. As many of you know, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act from 1986 um, leaves us in a situation right now where emails that are stored in a cloud um, may not be subject to warrants if people, if law enforcement wants to access information. So we had a very simple bill that passed the House called the Email Privacy Act just to say that digital information should be held to the same standard as a physical piece of paper in your file drawer um, and should be held to a, you know, a warrant standard. That passed the House, did not, has not passed the Senate. That seems very straightforward, that your digital information should also um, be held to a warrant standard. We haven't been able to pass that. Um, and so then we look at issues that I think people s are struggling to understand the issues more, like encryption, uh, makes it harder if we can't do some of those simple things to, to move forward on things like the Encrypt Act, which I think are critically important, but we've got to be moving forward on all these fronts. I'll throw it in here. Um, I think the Encrypt Act is great uh, in dealing with the issue of fragmentation among the states, but I also worry a lot about fragmentation internationally. Um, so given the significant concerns raised by other countries about their law enforcement's access to data through US providers, uh, in addition to the Encrypt Act, what do you think the US can do to address the international issue? Um, well, I think um, you're, you bring up a really important issue, and one of the things that kind of comes up if you talk about having backdoors in U.S. technology is that clearly um, other markets outside of the U.S. wouldn't want um, there to be a U.S. backdoor in technology. But also, if we weaken encryption um, in terms of what U.S. companies can make here, many people are going to find stronger encryption technologies from other players overseas, and so you don't really solve the problem um, if you're, you know, by by putting together laws in that way. I do think that um, we have to look at this globally and realize that people can use technologies that are developed in other places, um, for better or for worse, frankly, because we've had, you know, great concerns, whether it's antivirus technology, um, encryption technology, that there could be backdoors or access for providers outside of the U.S. as well, and so I think we have to think of this um, globally and understand the implications and and understand um, and be thoughtful, and consumers need to think about this too, of the technologies that they use, um, where they're coming from, and, and the security that's behind them. But clearly, we have a huge opportunity to lead in the US and to have strong technologies that, um, that people across our country and even other parts of the world can trust. But if we implement back doors, I think it'll be hard for folks to have that trust. Other questions? If not, I have uh, one more that I want to ask okay. you. So uh, our paper last year, trying to stop. Uh, our paper that we did um, about two years ago, we kind of identified a number of areas where um, the government could take action. And so um, certainly, you know, the Encrypt Act gets to the state issue. And then, you know, there's the other bill that gets to what the federal government can require of companies. Um, the other challenge is that we've seen in the past is, uh, you know, when it was revealed that NSA was involved in manipulating some of the uh, NIST standards that came out around encryption. So maybe not directly mandating a, a specific change, but kind of working behind the scenes to get companies to adopt something that they knew would be insecure. Any thoughts on whether that's a problem that could be addressed through legislation through, you know, a, a kind of a simple mandate that, you know, NSA can't weaken encryption? Well, I think 
I do think Congress needs to have a voice on these issues. And um, while we had the encryption working group and we're trying to come up with um, potential solutions, we weren't able to come up with you know specific legislative solutions. We were able to agree that mandating backdoors was a, a terrible idea. Um, but I do think that we need to look at things like um, email privacy. We need to look at issues like um, the Encrypt Act. But this is going to be an ongoing conversation. We need to look at legislation. We need to continue to see how technologies develop and be forward looking in terms of where they're headed. Um, we are very behind. Um, and the Email Privacy Act is a good example where we're trying to adjust, address an issue that was put in place in 1986 here in 2018. Um, we are definitely behind on policy. And so um, whether it's policy or having these conversations and understanding kind of what administrative actions are being taken, um, we need to be on top of that and forward looking. And I worry we're still catching up to yesterday. Can I follow up with one yeah. question on that? And thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Um, so, and my question is sort of almost suggesting I put myself out of a job here, but um, one of the things that it seems like Congress has missed most um, has just been technical expertise. Um, during the 1990s, Newt Gingrich uh, closed the Office of Technology Assessment, um, and that sort of just sucked all of the tech knowledge out of the room in the House of Representatives. Uh, think tanks like OTI and like Access Now and uh, academics have come in to fill that gap as much as possible, but do you think that there's a role for reopening OTA, um, for finding other ways to really reinvigorate the technology expertise at a staff level in the House of Representatives? Well, um, I agree that we need that expertise um, available. These are complicated issues, and sometimes the reason we don't move on technology policy isn't because it's partisan or someone doesn't like an issue, it's because they don't understand it. And when you don't understand something, your first reaction is to say, I don't wanna do anything. And I think that's been a huge stalemate on some issues because you know, the issue I brought up earlier of email privacy should be a fairly, it, seemingly a very straightforward issue. Um, you, you know, this is personal information, just because I have it on a piece of paper doesn't mean it should be treated differently than if it's in the cloud. Um, and when the law was written, it wasn't written imagining that we would have a cloud. Um, and so there's no legislative intent there. It should be a pretty simple thing. But we have, you know, most members of Congress aren't, I wouldn't say it's the, the body that is the most technology savvy, right? And so we have a lot of work to do. And I, I think that's why, you know, I've started the Internet of Things Caucus with Congressman Issa. I started the Digital Trade Caucus. I've been working very hard to create fora where we can come together and have these conversations and any other um, resources that would be available formally or informally, I think are going to be critically important because this is not the, we're going to have an ongoing set of, of, um, of new issues to address that people didn't contemplate given the evolution of technology. And we've got to be, once again, um, looking ahead as opposed to trying to always catch up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Great. That was a, the perfect way to kick off this conversation. We have a, a fantastic uh, panel here today, and, and uh, one panelist still en route. Um, so uh, let's just jump right in. Uh, let me first, I'll, I'll briefly go through and introduce our panelists. Everyone's information is on our website, though, so I'll keep this brief. Uh, starting on my left, uh, we have Robin Green, who's a policy counsel and government affairs lead at the Open Technology Institute uh, at New America. Uh, Will Carter is deputy director and a fellow at the Technology Policy Program at CSIS. Rihanna uh, Peppercorn is a cryptography fellow at the Stanford Center for Internet and Society. Uh, Mike Godwin will be joining us uh, momentarily. He's uh, a senior fellow at R Street Institute. Uh, and Amy uh, Stefanovic is the US policy manager at Access Now. Um, each of these individuals is really um, just deep, deep expertise on uh, both technology policy issues and encryption. So thanks to all of you for being here today. And, and uh, I know we've been talking about these issues a lot um, for many years. So it, this, I feel like this is an endurance sport almost to, to keep doing this. Um, but let's. Uh, I always like to start with the basics when we get into an encryption policy. We kind of uh, 
dove into the deep end a little bit here um, with, with this initial uh, conversation about some of the, um, the legislation that's out there. I want to start for anyone that's kind of coming new to this. Um, just let's start with the basics. You know, what's encryption uh, and why is it important? And Rihanna, uh, since uh, you specifically have cryptography in your job title, I will start with you uh, to explain that. Sure. So, I mean, in encryption is basically a means of uh, scrambling data from being in a legible format to being in something that is not legible, from taking a message that you or I could read in plain English or in a, you know, some other language uh, and converting it through, usually through mathematical algorithms now, but you know, through methods such as uh, uh, different ciphers that Thomas Jefferson invented and used back in the uh, 18th century uh, to convert that legible information into something that can only be decrypted if you know this the secret key for converting it back into what we call plain text communication. Great, and I'll, I'll just open up to the full panel, but you know, in terms of why is, it, why is it important? I mean, Amy, this is something that Access Now, for example, focuses uh, you know, a lot on. Um, you know, why is it so important to both individuals and, and to the larger society and businesses? Sure, so I want you all to take a second. I want you to think about your phones. I want you to think about what you did on your phone yesterday. I want you to think about what you did from when the moment you woke up to the moment you went to bed, what you searched for, what you watched, who you talked to, then think about the prior week. Um, and imagine that that data, the data you actually put into your phone, is really just the tip of the iceberg of all of the personal information the companies um, whose apps you download or the, who runs your server know about you based on what you do on your phone. Um, they know where you go. Sometimes they can figure out what doctor you go to. There's a lot of data out there about you. Um, and when that data goes into databases, um, encryption is what protects it from being accessed by bad people. And so it's not necessarily going to protect you in every single circumstance. It's not a cure-all. Um, there's always going to be information like metadata that's available and to date cannot be necessarily encrypted in a way that protects people from getting access to it. But the data at rest, the data in motion, what websites you're visiting, that is all best protected through the use of encryption. And now you're all sitting in this room. I imagine you don't feel like the police are going to come banging on your door in the middle of the night. We're all confident that that's not going to happen. Um, but it's not just about us then. It's about the whole world who uses the same devices. You know, we have about two cell phone manufacturers that have the global market pretty much locked down. There are a few others um, in the international market. Um, so many different uh, operating systems that operate on those cell phones. Android is used everywhere, no matter um, who manufactures your cell phone. And so you're thinking now of um, the kid who is in the LGBT community in a country where it is actually illegal to be gay, um, the journalist who is trying to track down um, a dissident in a country where it's illegal to criticize the government, um, these people are out there and encryption is often keeping them not only out of jail but keeping them alive. Um, so this is a really serious issue once you get outside of yourself. And so the reason that we've all spent way too many years, I would argue, discussing this issue is because I think we all feel like once we take a step in the direction of compromising encryption, it's a really, really slippery slope um, to bad results. Um, and so that is kind of what's at stake here. And then you'll hear on the other side, which is an important position, um, that encryption sometimes can prevent law enforcement from investigating crime, from getting access to information. It's important to recognize that position and then to talk about what else is out there. And I think Will will probably, I will segue over to Will who, who can address some of that. Sure. So the one thing I would add to what Amy is saying, which I completely agree with, is that one of the great things about encryption is that um, as any of us who have had a office uh, phishing test go out have experienced, um, protecting the perimeter of networks is always going to be flawed and limited as a security strategy. And so finding ways to ensure that when uh, adversaries get in, they can't necessarily make use of all of the data that's inside is really important. And I think that's what, that is at its core 
encryption's value proposition, if you think of it from the kind of broader cybersecurity perspective, it makes the data, even if you can get it, not useful to you as an attacker. Hopefully, hopefully. Um, so. Right. Yeah. And, and I would add that, you know, I think a lot of the focus in this debate tends to be on individuals and what's on our devices just in terms of our personal communications, that sorts of examples that Amy mentioned. But, you know, encryption, prior to becoming sort of popular in uh, consumer-facing applications such as text messaging apps um, or encrypting our smartphones, was originally used to protect national security related information. It's used to protect banking information, the financial sector. So encryption is what protects every financial transaction that you make. It's what protects uh, American intellectual property against theft. It's what prote protects against uh, industrial espionage. Uh, it's what could you know, protect against having information disclosed as part of a data breach in a time when there are massive data breaches coming out, more news every day. Um, protecting databases, as, as, as Will was mentioning, and of these sorts of just critical economic and national security and law enforcement related information, that's also being protected by encryption and needs to be strongly protected by the best possible uh, you know, efforts that we can make, um, whether that's an American provider or um, you know, some other company um, that's doing it. Um, we're not just talking about protecting yours and my communications with your loved ones. We're also talking about protecting assets that are absolutely critical to uh, the functioning of the country. But I think the, the, the protection piece is extremely important. It's something that we focus on a lot in the US, but I think another piece that is really important is cryptographic techniques are used for verification and integrity. Mm -hmm. um, so all the data that appears on your computer screen, without some means to verify the integrity of that data, particularly when there are important or high value transactions at stake, um, the entire that's based off these exchanges of information would break down. Um, we need to be able to trust the information that crosses the internet. That is largely enabled by cryptographic techniques today. Um, and so I think making sure that we keep in mind not just the security of our data, but the ability to have faith in the information that crosses the internet is critical um, and is also a, a, an issue around cryptography and encryption. And I would just add, I think the issue of authentication and verification of data extends not just to the data itself, but also to the devices that we now use to authenticate ourselves to access data. So, you know, we talk about encryption in this like really high level sense, like, you know, it's uh, scrambling words so that they're uh, un un illegible or ununderstandable, um, and then you use a key to decrypt them, right? But there are two types of encryption. There is the encryption of data at rest. So that is all of the data that's stored on my device right now. Like I'm not communicating with my device, but it's got a tremendous amount of information on me. And then it also has access to cloud uh, providers that also have even more information on me, um, but that's still all data at rest. And then there's data uh, in transit, right? And so that's the sort of end-to-end -end encryption we're talking about when we talk about our financial transactions um, and, uh, and securing the contents of our communications as they transit from the sender to the recipient. Um, but most of the debate in the U.S., um, and this isn't true internationally, but most of the debate in the U.S. has started to focus around uh, data at rest. So how are we securing our devices with unbreakable encryption? And that's incredibly important because law enforcement has sort of adopted this position that, well, it's easier and less dangerous to break the encryption of a device because that data is at rest. There's not really the risk that everything that we're communicating everywhere will become vulnerable. It's just whatever you can get your hands on. But that's not really true. Our devices are our primary authenticators now. I use my phone to get my uh, access to my email, to get access to whatever diaries and logs and communications I have. So while it's not affecting the communications that I'm sending, so if I text message a friend on Signal, that wouldn't be affected if the government backdoored my device. It would still mean that the moment the government got a hold of my device, it could access all of my emails, all of my text messages, 
all of my records of the places that I've gone and the appointments that I have in my calendar. And that's true for everybody all over the world, right? So we all use our devices in more or less the same way. Our threat models are different in terms of like who's going to actually try to get into our devices and for what purposes. But at the end of the day, these are our diaries. These are our papers and effects now. Um, but they're also our authenticators. They are how we prove that we can get into all of our sensitive accounts, that we can access all of our sensitive information. And if you're from a particularly vulnerable population, then the security of your device is all that much more important. And then, you know, the last thing that I would just say is you can't engage in a meaningful line drawing experiment, right? So one of the things that Rihanna was talking about was, well, we use encryption uh, to fight uh, industrial espionage, right? To protect intellectual property, whether that's uh, you know media contents, whether that is the chemical makeup of a new ph pharmaceutical product that will you know cure cancer, whatever innovative thing the US is creating, it's likely stored somewhere and protected by various uh, you know, different techniques, whether it's encryption or two-factor, multi-factor authentication, or hopefully both. Um, you are still creating an environment if you allow a backdoor um, where you can't draw the line between this device and the device that those data are, st are stored on, um, in part because maybe I can access them from that device, and then in part just because it's sort of a singular market in the sense of like how are we creating computing devices and you know who gets to have encryption and not, and what device has what capability. Um, so that's, that's just my two cents. <laughs> Great. Um, Mike, let me draw you in on this. I want to pick up on the, uh, Robin's point about kind of some of this imprecise language. Some of the language that we hear around law enforcement, they're, they're calling it, as uh, Representative Albany said, warrant proof encryption. Um, on the other side, you know, we often talk about backdoors. Are these descriptions accurate? Um, what's the right way to look at these issues? Well, so I have a, let, let me unpack this a little bit and just say that, you know, this is a debate that, uh, as you know, uh, law enforcement and also the intelligence agencies have engaged in for more than 20 years. But the, the, the idea, you know, when they call it warrant proof, I think what they want, I think it's misleading uh, because they have the idea that when you have a warrant, you have an absolute 100% right to succeed in any search and seizure you do of any device or any encrypted communication that you have. If, once you have a warrant signed by a magistrate, you have an absolute right to have a successful investigation. That's not really true. I mean, if you think about it, uh, 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 there's no guarantee that when people have a search warrant that uh, they're going to succeed in finding the evidence that they're looking for in any other context. It may be that the evidence is not there. It may be that the person, in fact, who's under suspicion is innocent. Uh, so there are all sorts of uh, reasons that you may not be able to recover that information. Uh, what we found, what I found and work on this issue for more than 25 years has been, uh, in some sense, you know, when citizens think about the Bill of Rights, they think about, uh, you know, limits on government power, they think about their rights as against the government, but oddly, uh, some government agencies have looked at the Fourth Amendment as an amendment that says that if you have a warrant, you have a right they have a right, in other words, the law enforcement has a fundamental right to get the information that they're looking for. Uh, and I think that's wrong, it really shifts the balance. Um, so uh, th that talk I think is misleading. Uh, we, what we really wanna do is remember that, um, you know, we're all human beings here, there's no 100% right to anything, uh, but uh, if we are looking at um, uh, the encryption issue, we shouldn't talk about it in legal terms. I think we should talk about it partly in terms of individual autonomy and liberty and partly in terms of the technology because uh, what they're asking for, uh, uh, what uh, law enforcement intelligence agencies frequently are asking for are things that might actually undermine our ability to protect our own rights. And I don't know if that's quite responsive to where you were going, but I came in in the middle of that discussion, so no, I want to make sure that I catch up. Sure. Uh, Amy. I just want to come in a little bit on the, the technical point that Mike brings up. Let's talk about this in technical language. And a term that Robin used that I, I, I wrote down when you said it, uh, because I know what you meant, was unbreakable encryption, because you're quoting the law enforcement side. When you say that, they, they talk a lot about unbreakable encryption. and. The, it's true to an extent. Um, the encryption that's available today, if you were trying to brute force your way into it um, in a perfect world where everything worked the way that it's supposed to work, 
Um, it could probably take you until the heat death of the universe to, to do that. Um, un- unfortunately, fortunately, whatever you want to use in the front of the sentence, um, we don't live in a perfect world. Um, and every single, I think, device, application, um, program out there is built with flaws. Um, Matt Blaze, who is the cryptographer who ended up demonstrating that a tool that they were trying to use in the 90s to backdoor encryption just didn't work, um, often says that cryptographers are really bad at their jobs. Um, and I love quoting him on that because he's, he's talking about himself and what he's essentially saying is, we don't get it right. And so anything, ha- everything has a flaw, which means almost everything can be broken into eventually. And this gets to the Inspector General's report that Re- Representative Del Bene mentioned where the people who were trying to get into the Apple iPhone did not speak to third parties or any of these contractors before they were making the statement that the only way to get into it was to go to Apple and have them build these alternative capabilities to get in. Now, we're not, I'm not trying to say that I think that um, having government officials hack into phones and systems is a good idea. Um, what I'm trying to say is it's a route that is available, that is effective, and that we should probably be talking about what safeguards and protections need to be in place if they're going to engage in that activity, which they are. Um, because the the people who are trying to get access through encrypted data are only getting more and more sophisticated, and encryption really needs to respond by also getting more and more sophisticated as well. And so undermining it isn't really a good solution, more we have to accept it, um, encourage it, because as Rihanna said, it's essential to many of the systems we rely on, and then try to figure out what else we need to be doing. Um, And if we could get past this, if we could stop talking about encryption, I plea once a week that if you guys never want me to talk about encryption again, I am happy to never bring this topic up again. If law enforcement would just say they never want to undermine it, and then we can move on to some of these other topics that are much more significant, need conversations to be had about them much more urgently, um, and will get us somewhere, potentially. Can can I just add a little bit uh, here? And that's that the way I think about this, I always look at previous law enforcement challenges. When the telephone was invented, it became possible to engage in a criminal conspiracy, and nobody would see you and the uh, co-conspirators together plotting your crime. You know, you could just call them up, and, and it was private. Now, one thing that law enforcement did is they – well, one thing the government certainly could have done is they could have outlawed private phone calls. <laughs> I mean, they certainly could have done that. Uh, but what they did instead uh, is, the, is government law enforcement agencies eventually figured out that they could do wiretapping, and that was like the first phone hacking. That was the first hacking when they realized that they could attach alligator clips to the wires and capture private communications. And that law enforcement, uh, uh, not always entirely justified in this, but they think thought that was a real a sense of progress. And what ultimately developed, it took a while, too long in my opinion, is that we developed a legal framework that governs what law enforcement can do with regard to wiretaps. And similarly, uh, if, if the government is, and I think certainly the intelligence agencies are, if the law enforcement and intelligence agencies are going to hack, try to hack encryption or try to get past digital security measures, we need to have a legal framework for that. So that is me chiming in on Amy's point. So, but, uh, so I, I agree, but I think that uh, if you go down that road, it also leads to the dangerous conclusion that uh, Congress did ultimately decide that companies should be forced to help facilitate government hacking those uh, voice communications over the phone wires, um, which I, I think some of the folks at the table probably would not uh, be huge fans of that conclusion in this debate. Um, and certainly Apple, as demonstrated by the San Bernardino case, wouldn't. Right. Um, but I would say on the broader point about terminology, The term warrant-proof encryption, I think that law enforcement uses it because they like to emphasize the fact that in many of the cases that most frustrate them, they've already gone through a process that has extensive oversight and checks and balances that's required them to get an independent warrant from an independent judge, and that they've had to demonstrate probable cause, relevance, um, and a variety of other legal standards in order to try to get access to that data. And so their frustration is that there are mechanisms that go above and beyond what they see as the long-standing protections that have been put in place by the Fourth Amendment to ensure that the, that the data that they get access to is data that it is appropriate for them to have. I think part of what 
I don't like about that term is in many cases, uh, much of the data that is unavailable from a certain warrant directed to a certain provider to get the data in a certain way may be available through another warrant or other type of court order issued to a different person in the supply chain uh, to get that data in another way. So whether it's a cloud backup from data that is also stored on a phone that is full disk encrypted and the cloud backup may be accessible or through targeting the another device that was a party to the communication that is not um, encrypted with uh, in a form that is inaccessible with law enforcement's most available techniques. But I think that there is, I also am, if there's one term though that really frustrates me, it's when the statement is used that any approach that would facilitate law enforcement access must by necessity lead to weak encryption that one I don't quite like. Part of the reason is I think it's a bit hypocritical when it comes from companies, for example, Google, which uses a form of encryption on Gmail that they can access. Um, they would, I, I would be, I cannot imagine a scenario in which a Google executive would say that Gmail is insecure or that the encryption used in Gmail is weak. Um, but it is accessible in a form that law enforcement could use to get that data from Google. So I, I think that the terms on both sides can be misleading in certain ways, but I understand why people use them. Some of the most brunt, uh, blunt force approaches that law enforcement might advocate for to ensure their access to data would weaken encryption in ways that are unnecessary and would be damaging. Um, but to have a nuanced discussion, I think you have to see why people use the slightly inaccurate terms that they use. Um, and we have to look for to what extent can we direct law enforcement to other providers who might be able to get them the data they need without impacting encryption at certain points in the chain? To what extent can we implement cryptographic techniques for certain devices or certain types of communication that are accessible to law enforcement but that are also strong? I think there's a wider range of options than the conversation indicates. So yeah. I want to... Oh, uh, let me go to you. Let me uh, pull the conversation a little bit uh, forward. I, I want us to focus on one of the points Will brought up, and then we'll circle back to a few other ones. So um, I want to stay on the point about... Um, you, you know, uh, Google uh, and, and the question of, um, you know, uh, shared keys or key escrow. There's various proposals out there. Um, recently, Ray Ozzie's made a lot of headlines, uh, former uh, CTO at Microsoft, for arguing that it is possible to solve this problem. Exactly the point kind of that you were making, Will, that it's not a, a debate between um, you either get great encryption or you have no encryption. It's, you know, well, we can do various versions of key escrow, and that's what we're asking for, so stop your complaining about, <laughs> you know, weakening encryption. Uh, so, Robin, let me start with you. I mean, uh, can you kind of, you've, I'm sure you've seen the proposal, and you've seen others like it as well. What's your reaction to that line of argument that we're hearing from law enforcement? Yeah, so I think, um, first, I just want to say uh, what Rayazi's proposal is, <laughs> which is basically a key escrow system, right? So Rayazi has said that what he wants to do is develop a secret master key um, that would be hard coded onto the device itself. Um, and then what would happen was if law enforcement could show the company that they had a warrant, um, then the company would basically disclose that key so that the device could be unlocked. Um, and it would have a kill switch essentially where the moment that that key was disclosed and the device was unlocked, um, it would be bricked. So you would not be able to use the device for any purpose other than to extract the data that was already stored on the device. But you would never be able to use it um, prospectively for text messaging, for accessing the internet, for making phone calls, or for any of the other bazillion things we all use our devices for. Um, so that's what his proposal is. Um, when I hear people talk about this idea that you can do it you know, in a secure fashion, I point you back to Rayazi's proposal because what, um, what Ozzy did, um, which is what everyone making these kind of proposals should do, is he took his idea um, and started doing workshops uh, over the idea with other cryptography experts. Um, and at one of those workshops at Columbia, um, one of the cryptographers, on the spot, after a very high-level description of what this, uh, what this solution would do, uh, identified a flaw. Um, and was able to figure out a way to sort of game his system in order to enable someone who was not a law enforcement uh, 
officer or, you know, Justice Department or other kind of prosecutor um, with a warrant uh, to access the master key and get all of the data stored on the device. Um, And so I think that's a great illustration of a few things. One, you know, how incredibly hard it is, um, I think, impossible to come up with a secure key escrow solution. Um, I think the second thing is that we saw folks, you know, running before they could walk with this idea. Law enforcement was clamoring behind it and touting it and, and using it to show that folks like me and the other people on this panel just don't know what we're talking about. And, you know, the folks at Apple are just refusing to nerd hard enough, and here we have Rayazi who found the solution. But he didn't. His solution's already flawed. I think the, thec- sec- uh, the third thing that we all need to learn from that, though, is his solution, as I said, is at the highest level. It's like the nascent stages of the development, um, and he has thought only about what is the key escrow construct, not how do I build this securely into a system, which is actually the hard question the hard question, figuring out how do I implement this form of encryption, right, into this more complex system that involves the secure enclave on my iPhone in this case, that involves, you know, hard coding it into all of these devices, protecting that, making sure that whoever holds the keys at Apple is secure, and that the fact that they will be accessing those keys countless times a day, because it's not like the FBI is the only shop in town that's going to be wanting that master key disclosed. Um, It's going to be every law enforcement agency, not only domestically, Um, but from wherever encrypted devices are sold. Um, And that doesn't even get to the the problem, which Amy very rightly pointed out, which is that encryption is built and implemented by humans and humans error, and so there is always a flaw to be exploited. The moment you hard code that key into the device, you can't get the device back. You are putting the entire marketplace in a position where they can either have a fatally flawed, insecure device from the moment that flaw is identified, um, and it doesn't take long, we can talk a little bit about that soon to identify the flaws, Um, or they have to destroy their device and buy an entirely new one. And whether you're going, you know, with an Android-based device, which will cost you a few hundred dollars, or an iPhone, which can cost upwards of a thousand dollars, that's a pretty massive investment. Um, and so that's really not something that we should be asking people to do, especially since we know that one of the main reasons why the default encryption was actually uh, implemented on iPhones, it wasn't because of Snowden. I mean, that you know, was sort of like a coinciding event. It was because people's iPhones kept getting stolen. There was a massive theft problem, and that theft problem reduced by 30% the moment Apple started using default encryption. Imagine if we intentionally build vulnerabilities that anyone can access and that, like right now, any criminal can purchase the tool that they need to access an unlimited number of phones for, you know, fifteen to $30,000, but then can reap all the benefits from let, that. Let me add, uh, let me add, I know Rihanna wants to say something too, but let me add very quickly, there are even a couple of other layer, uh, levels of complexity to add to this, even if we ha- roughly agreed on what the technical solution would be for key escrow. One of them is that if you do it for criminal process or intelligence process, of course, there's no reason to think that if there were a civil lawsuit, you couldn't use it to recover, uh, to you know, to recover data on somebody's phone. Because if the tendency is to treat all your data on your phone as like a document, documents are compelled to be produced uh, in civil proceedings all the time. And once you know that it's technically possible, then you are, then you can subject either the vendor or or the uh, opposing party to a legal process. Uh, you know, and require the disclosure of that stuff. Uh, secondly, um, there's an international dimension to this too, because a lot of a lot of times these discussions are very inwardly focused or domestically focused, and we think in terms of what the FBI wants or what the NSA wants. But in fact, in, you know, internationally there are different regimes with different re- degrees of respect and due process for individual rights. Uh, to the extent that we want to have uh, uh, this model of key escrow or any model of backdoor implemented, remember, we're living in a world market. So, the, so there are issues about whether 
if we, impl if we somehow succeeded in implementing these backdoors uh, internationally, it means that governments that may not be terribly kind to the people that they're investigating also will have access to this one way or the other. And the, and the second thing is, if, the, if it doesn't become universal, then actually you create uh, uh, markets for people outside the United States to create truly secure encryption. And in fact, uh, you know, there's no law that says that Apple has or, or that Android phones have to be the dominant models for, for uh, mobile phones in the future. Uh, you certainly, if you want to create markets for phones that are produced in other countries uh, that are more secure, you could absolutely try to do this first in the United States. Brianna, I mean, it just it, it strikes me so how you know this argument is exactly like the argument around Clipper Chip was in the '90s. I mean, even the proposals are are so very similar. And uh, I mean, you, you study this very closely. I'd like I'd love your reaction. So I want to pull together a couple of comments that other people have made. Um, to highlight the fact that when, when we're talking about this debate, Susan Landau, who has been working, uh, she's a cryptographer and computer science professor who's been working on this for 25 years and who has been very critical of Ray Ozzie's proposal, has said that you know what we're talking about is a matter of law enforcement e efficiency when it comes to investigations. So we'll mention that um, there are other resources that the police can go to to get information that might be held uh, on a device, such as going to Apple and saying, I want the backups in the cloud of this device, or going to Gmail and saying, I want the email that would otherwise you know, easily be accessible from just opening up the device. Um, Metadata can be used to reconstruct the contacts of people that you've been communicating with, uh, even if you don't necessarily get to just flip through the contacts uh, on your phone. Um, and so one thing that I think has made the crypto wars so-called flare back up again in recent times is the introduction of the smartphone that pulls together all of these disparate sources of data that law enforcement used to have to go to individually um, or you know, reconstruct with a lot of resources all in one you know, very convenient package. And so the prospect of losing that efficiency is understandably you know, nettlesome to them. But what we're talking about here is all risks and trade-offs. And when Ray Ozzie was facing critiques of his proposal, that is something that he said. He said, look, my proposal isn't the answer. There is no answer. It's all risks and trade-offs. And I think those trade-offs from all different perspectives, all the different stakeholders, are things that do not often enough get uh, illuminated in this conversation, uh, particularly when you know, law enforcement's needs tend to be the most dominant framing that these are that these are viewed through. Um, I published a white paper through the Center for Internet and Society earlier this year that illuminates some of the economic trade-offs, uh, some of the security trade-offs, some of the human rights trade-offs that Amy's been talking about. Um, but I think that you know, one way to move forward around this debate is just to be, you know to have a more frank assessment of what those risks are, what the trade-offs are, and what benefit we could expect. Because one of the problems with proposals such as Ray Ozzie's is that even if we accept a trade-off in terms of security, uh, if we were to have a backdoor type mandate, uh, we wouldn't necessarily actually get the benefits that supposedly we would be promised from those things because of all the different um, alternatives and uh, such as importing phones from you know other countries that don't comply with a backdoor mandate uh, such as moving uh, encryption just to the app level so that even if you were able to break into a device through a, a you know a key escrow mandate for a smartphone you might still be faced with uh, encrypted apps or encrypted information on the phone so all of these are you know things that I don't get don't think it brought up enough is what are the benefits we would actually be able to expect from having some kind of regulation in place and would we actually be able to see and realize those benefits and then on the flip side what are the trade-offs to security to individual privacy and civil liberties to international human rights to the economy um, you know to national security and to law enforcement as just some of the stakeholders in this debate and just Amy, to add in um, frame yeah, question, go ahead. I'll, I'll go to you on this yeah. but I, um, I want to talk about kind of the the context of the debate we're having right now because mm -hmm. um, you know it, obviously we had the, we had the crypto wars in the ninety in the nineties and then you know after San Bernardino this is when the issue kind of came up and was red hot again and what was interesting to me in that debate is um, you know you even had President Obama at the time do an interview a great interview I think it was with uh, Kara Swisher where he he really outlined these trade offs you know exactly right right than what you were talking about he you know in a very articulate way. In, in quite a bit of depth, he really laid out, you know, well, I understand law enforcement's perspective mm -hmm. here, and I understand civil liberties' perspective here, uh, and I, 
I don't think there's a way to reconcile these. And so, you know, one, if we do anything, we're going to go slow. And, you know, two, you know, yeah, civil rights are, are really important. People's freedom is important. We're probably not going to do anything. Uh, and it, it kind of illustrated those, those key tensions, right, between law enforcement, intelligence community, and then Department of Commerce and, um, uh, you know, the, the kind of the tech experts within the administration and, and the competing advice he was getting. Um, in, in this administration, it seems like the law enforcement voice is a lot stronger um, and, and more dominant. So, you know, can you kind of contextualize the debate and how we're actually seeing it play out now? Because it used to be, even within government, you'd have, you know, both sides of the conversation. And it, it seems like right now we're really only hearing from the law enforcement side. Sure. And just to, I mean, we've been fighting about encryption in this country so long as, almost as long as we have been a country. Does anybody know Aaron Burr? He was in a play recently, character in a play. <laughs> second, third vice president of the United States. Um, he actually, the very first case about encryption was in, involved Aaron Burr. That's how long we've been fighting about encryption in this country. Um, and to add a little bit, it's not only about present trade-offs, but it's about potential future trade-offs. Um, we have, because phone systems, as Will mentioned, um, have to be designed to allow law enforcement to intercept communications. We have a massively, a massively vulnerable phone system globally, um, which is a big problem. Because of export controls on encryption, um, implemented back in the 70s, fought about through the 90s, uh, we had a bug that called the freak bug that implicated most popular operating systems on cell phones and computers. Um, so we never know when we start putting things in place how those things are going to affect systems down the road. And with the growth of the Internet of Things, which is thankful to, to Representative, Representative Del Bene for setting up the Internet of Things caucus, the implications of establishing a regime now that will cause – why do I keep calling them invulnerability? Cause vulnerabilities down the road um, could burn a house down or any other number of things that happen when IoT devices get hacked into. Um, I think there's a strange hypocrisy happening in this administration where we have um, simultaneously law enforcement getting told that they have too much authority and they abuse their authority, but then being given more authority and less oversight. Um, and we saw this in the debate over um, FISA Amendments Act 702 where Generally speaking, the intelligence apparatus is being told, we think you abused your authority by the White House, but also we support you having more authority with less oversight. And that's true in the encryption debate as well, where we are talking about cybersecurity and the great necessity to increase security, to have um, more tools that are available to protect our systems. But at the same time, we need to do something that causes law enforcement to be able to break through those systems when they want to. We need a system that fails when we want it to and never any other time. Um, and the, the cybersecurity side is being kind of silenced in the encryption debate. They're not really being included over there. Um, in some circumstances, the agencies are being built in a way to preempt that. So recently, recently, in the last three or four years, we had the National Security Agency, which had previously had two separate arms, an information assurance arm that was supposed to protect systems and a signals intelligence arm that was supposed to break into systems. And they were supposed to be doing both missions, and they were like, oh, we think these missions should actually be combined into one great big mission, and we're not totally sure how that's going to look. Um, but let's make them work closer together. Already the IA mission um, was kind of, being subservient to the signals intelligence mission. Um, we talked, uh, Daniel, I think you're the one who brought up uh, cryptography standards being undermined in order to conduct surveillance. Um, the cryptography standards that IA was supposed to set up being made subservient to the signals intelligence mission. Now with them being combined, you're seeing that cybersecurity point of view um, being left out of this debate from a government perspective. And civil society, academic experts, technologists are really having to come in and provide that from the outside. Thank you. Um, Mike, let me go to you next. As you've obviously mm -hmm. seen the debate firsthand the first time around. How is it the same now? How is it different? 
Well, so I, 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 there are lots of ways that it's the same, and there are a couple of ways that it's different. But let me just point, underscore this by saying, you know, the most, uh, the loudest advocate for backdoors and encryption a couple of years ago was FBI Director Comey. He's not in government anymore. Uh, the, the the second loudest since then has been uh, 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 since it has been uh, Rod Rosenstein, uh, who maybe doesn't have the ear of the president on this issue. Uh, so it's it, you know it's I'm not saying there's a jinx, but there could be a jinx associated with uh, advocating backdoors. <laughs> um, so having said that, uh, uh, you know in the 90s, uh, uh, and Amy referred to this in the 90s, uh, there was an effort by government, uh, and, and the Clinton administration was more or less won over by this idea at least for a while. Uh, to uh, develop a government standard for secure encryption that would be secure as to everything that any individual would want or everything any company would want, uh, but uh, would provide access under special circumstances to law enforcement and to intelligence agencies. And uh, as we discussed earlier, that, that standard turned out to be flawed. It turned out to be uh, 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 beatable by uh, Matt Blaze and some other people who learned how to figure out how to do it. The difference between that debate and now is that the advocates for backdoors have no ask. They do not have a specific proposal in place. They, don't ha they haven't adopted Ray Ozzie's proposal. They haven't adopted another version of the clipper chip. What they do is they sort of knock on the door of Congress and say, wouldn't it be nice if we had a mandate of some sort that created backdoors of some sort uh, uh, for encryption? Uh, and, and in a way, what they've done is tried to immunize themselves from, uh, from having you know, their argument kicked out from under them when, the, when a particular proposal turns out to be flawed by not having a particular proposal. And so what they really want to do is uh, push uh, legislators and other policymakers to demand of uh, cryptographers and of the tech industry to develop a standard. We don't care what it is as long as it enables special access uh, for law enforcement and intelligence agencies. And in doing that, they are not only dodging the technical issues themselves, but they're also uh, encouraging lawmakers and policymakers to dodge the technical issues also. Uh, and I think that's a mistake. I think the real way to make progress on this is for uh, members of Congress and their staffs to really nerd harder themselves. They need to learn enough about the technology to know what's really feasible and what isn't. And I know that's a learning curve problem, but let's face it, we live in the 21st century. We've got learning curve problems all the time. Things are changing. You know, I'm, I'm sorry nobody gets a break on this, but we really have to brain up here and learn a lot more about what's technically possible with encryption. I just want to add, because I do think there's one other really important thing that is significantly different this time around from last time around. And that's just the world, right? When we had this debate during the crypto wars of the 1990s, the internet was used, you know, start, it was starting to be increasingly used by the broader public. But, you know, we were talking dial-up and, you know, AOL and things like that. And it was really only a segment of the population that, had, were, you know, were buying PCs and connecting to the internet and really incorporating digital technologies into their life on a regular basis. Today, the first thing that we do when we wake up is go to some sort of digital technology, whether it's the alarm clock we set on our phone or our smartwatch or our smart house, everything's connected. We are utterly dependent on digital technologies, and those technologies, as Amy pointed out, are or should be utterly dependent on strong encryption. So the potential ramifications of undermining that encryption um, or weakening that encryption are far greater today than they would have been in the 90s. And just to give some perspective, I want to quote Matt Blaze again, who you know references the ramifications of the crypto wars of the 90s and how they have affected our security today. And he described them as unbounded and unpredictable because the act of having that debate and the effect of the export controls that made it so that folks couldn't, you know, companies couldn't export strong encryption, it dumbed down security for everybody. It made companies, uh, you know, go to the lowest common denominator so that they could sell the same product everywhere. And we're still feeling the effects of that today. Um, the only difference is if we do it again, everything that we use in our daily lives is going to be affected. And that just wasn't the case back then. So can we talk about, uh, I'll turn it to you, Will, but I'd like to stick on this point that Robin brings up. I mean, one of the biggest challenges, it seems, is, you know, the government 
I mean, in theory, we could imagine, because it's been done before, the government mandating a lower security standard for all the devices that most consumers are going to use. The challenge, of course, is that who they're really after, you know, when they talk about the terrorists and you know, things like that, aren't going to be the ones who necessarily use these devices. So it's, it's very easy to get bad security for kind of the, the good guys. It's really hard to get bad security for the bad guys. Can you talk about that challenge? Because you've, you've talked about it a little bit in terms of the, the international implications, which is where this comes in. Yeah, uh, certainly. Um, but one thing I would add just on the previous question about what has changed, I, I agree with what's been said about what's changed since the 90s, but I also think there's a reason that this debate has become really pointed in the last five or so years, which is the change from the last five or so years to the 15 or so before that is that um, forms of encryption that uh, render data inaccessible to law enforcement, at least by the techniques they're used to using, have become much more widespread. Um, so full disk encryption on so cell phones was really not widely used at all five years ago, and Apple introduced it, and even in 20, as, as recently as 2016, virtually no Android phones used it. Um, and Android and Google were actively out there pounding the pavement trying to get the device makers to actually enable it, um, but that took a while. Now that's changing. Um, so, and the same with, you know, over-the-top apps that use end-to-end -end encryption, much more widespread now than they used to be. And then you layer on that Snowden, which Snowden and the tensions between the tech community and the government in general have ma meant that the relationship between the tech industry and law enforcement has broken down to the point that even data that is not protected by unrecoverable encryption that is clearly covered by a completely legitimate warrant is much harder for law enforcement to get than it has been in the past. So I think there's a lot of things that y you have to recognize the legitimate challenges that have developed for law enforcement, although there are also benefits on the other side. On the international piece, I think that that is a real challenge. How do you now that the math is out there, because like Rihanna said, encryption is just math, and, and there's so much widely available data on how to mathematically alter data in such a way that it cannot be read without a key, um, that bad guys who are smart enough and determined enough will figure out how to do it, um, or they will find a vendor somewhere in the world that will do it. There's another side to it, though, which is that the rest of the world is getting to the point where they will no longer tolerate a, the, the services of US providers that use these forms of encryption, um, and they will no longer tolerate the US saying, we refuse to make this law and we, don't, we won't allow you to make this law, they're getting ready to start moving on their own. And I worry about that a lot because I envision a scenario in which because of mandates put in places like China, um, which have clear mandates in their laws that say, if you're a technology provider, you have to facilitate access for our law enforcement. If they enforce those laws in such a way that all of our devices are made insecure and the US government continues to be unable to get access to that data, it just means we're going to have worse cybersecurity, less privacy, and we're going to have less effective law enforcement. Um, so I think that on the international piece in particular, it's important to establish consensus, at least among our allies, partly so that when we develop, when we figure out how we want to balance these equities in the current technological environment, it's something that's not easily bad, bad, bypassed by bad actors. But I also think it's important because if we don't establish a model that allows law enforcement to work at least better than it is now, not just for us, but for a lot of countries, we're going to end up seeing other countries acting unilaterally in ways that I think will be even more harmful than potential compromise solutions or at least measures that don't necessarily directly impact encryption but that make law enforcement more effective for everyone. Yeah. Um, Robin, let me uh, bring you in. I mean, on, on the China question specifically, I mean, I think when we think about the debate playing out over the next maybe five to 10 years, I mean, it, it does seem likely that there will be one country that has enough economic power to, to mandate something like this. Um, and then the question will be, will do other countries follow? You know, if once you have one doing it, it's very easy to then, you know, the, the proponents of it to say, look, uh, it works well enough over there. If there's any problems, here's how we're going to fix it. Let's do it here, too. Do you see that as a challenge? I mean, I think the international space is absolutely a challenge and a concern. Um, I think one of the important things that advocates both here and abroad need to continue to do is to just educate lawmakers all over the world and educate the public, too, about how critical encryption is to their privacy, to their security, to their economy, I mean, to every aspect of their lives, to their national security. Um, and so the more empowered and educated the citizens of those countries are, 
the better because it will become much harder for those countries, especially where they are our allies, which are, you know, primarily democratic regimes, um, you know, it will be much harder for them to implement these kinds of backdoor mandates, um, either for data at rest or data in motion. Um, but I also want to give Amy the opportunity as our resident human rights expert and international uh, law expert uh, to weigh in here as well. <laughs> so I actually have a question for Will, and I'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> so China does have the, the mandate that Will indicated. Um, the UK also has a mandate, and it gets to the point that Mike raised, which is they didn't put forward an actual mandate. They just said, we want to have the power to issue these technical capability notices to companies. Um, those notices will be private. Nobody will really know what we're ordering them to do. And we're going to order companies to do something, potentially. Um, and so they're in the process of implementing that now. Uh, both the UK and China um, actually pointed to the United States and in some cases said, well, they have this power already. We need it too. Um, because the debate in the U.S. has been so weirdly interpreted outside of the country that countries already think that we have a backdoor mandate in law. Um, Brazil does as well. Brazil's been pushing for a, a backdoor provision in their law based on the U.S. already having one. Um, and I had to dissuade some law enforcement people there of, of that opinion, um, and they did not believe me for a while, actually. Um, so my, my question to Will is, I agree that if China were to enforce their law, it would be bad. In fact, um, for reference, China ha has no upper limit on the fine that they can issue to a company for a serious violation of not turning over data, not being able to turn over data in response to a request. So if they want to go after Apple for not turning over information, technically speaking, they could own Apple. They could fine as much as they wanted. Um, so this is a really serious problem. I don't understand how that problem gets mitigated by the U.S. also having a backdoor provision. I think it actually gets worse. So what I, I guess what I'm saying is not that the U.S. Should, should establish a backdoor provision so that other countries don't do it first. Like I said, I think one of the biggest reasons that we are in this situation now is actually because of all of the non-encryption related difficulties that have arisen for law enforcement trying to invest cases, investigate cases that involve digital evidence, whether it's the difficulties of getting um, fast and comprehensive responses from companies when they do receive lawful orders, whether it's the issues with cross-border data access and mutual legal assistance treaties, uh, whether it's the difficulties of just, for the average cop, it, it can be difficult to know which service providers have what data um, or, or what apps a certain user is using. They, you know that the guy has a phone. Do you know what kind of phone it is? Do you know what version it is? Do you know what apps he has on it? The world has just gotten much harder for law enforcement. And I guess my point is that if we don't want to go down the route of putting, of implementing a backdoor mandate, I think that figuring out ways to address other parts of law enforcement's challenges that make them more effective without compromising our fundamental equities, whether it's security, privacy, or anything else, um, looking for ways to ease the friction is going to be a key way to address the concerns of other countries who may not wait for us. Um, and that in, and that if we can establish a system that allows law enforcement access to more data, whether it's the data that's encrypted or other data that they might otherwise need, particularly data that they at least theoretically have access to under their existing authorities and legal structures, and to do it more easily, we need to articulate a vision to address these concerns that other countries can then uh, benefit from without having to go down the road of implementing their own policies. So can I, can I build on that? So I want to challenge the idea that there is a uniform uh, approach by other countries to say um, you know, that encryption is a problem and we need to have some law to address it. So countries that Amy has studied, such as Brazil or such as Australia or such as the UK, do take that stance. But we see a very heterogeneous approach, especially within Europe, um, which you know has similar you know, Western democracy style governments that we, as, as we do. And so those are different from the challenges that you face in some place like China. Um, but the European Parliament 
issued a questionnaire, took a poll of the law enforcement agencies of the member states uh, saying, how does encryption impact your work? You know, what kind of problems do you see? And what do you want to do about it? And all of the responding countries, and there were about a dozen or so, said, yeah, this does affect our work. It might be, you know, they respond on different types. Some said that it was web traffic encryption that was impacting them. Some said Tor. Um, but none of them said, we think there should be a new law passed in our country to weaken encryption for our purposes. None of them did. What they uniformly, pretty uniformly said was, we need more resources, to go to Will's point, to help us to, you know, to fight this issue and to make sure that we can still do our jobs efficiently. And one example of a country that I think is kind of leading the way on this is Germany, which has this motto of security through encryption and security despite encryption. And what they've done is establish a new center um, within the government, within the military uh, in Munich that is going to be staffed up, hopefully with the best and brightest that they have, that will have lots of funding um, to explore alternatives for trying to circumvent encryption and be able to get access to data, as Will mentioned, um, without having to actually undermine encryption algorithms directly. Now, this is a contentious issue within our community and within cryptographers, um, what we call government hacking or lawful hacking, um, ways of using existing bugs within software and hardware products because security is hard and we're very bad at it, uh, as the cryptographers will, themselves will tell you. Um, we can make use of those flaws without requiring companies intentionally to insert flaws and vulnerabilities into the encryption that they implement. Um, and the United States already makes use of this. At federal, state, and local law enforcement levels use what are called Celebrite devices, gray key devices, you might have heard about these, um, that are commercially available from these third party vendors, uh, in addition to you know, tools that uh, the FBI and other agencies home roll within, you know, within their own capabilities to try and find ways to uh, use the vulnerabilities in you know, commercial and enterprise level products to get access to data uh, without trying to break the encryption, which as Amy said, could take until the heat death of the universe. So that is one example, um, a contentious example, but one example of what Will was saying of law enforcement being able to get access uh, to information, finding ways to access it uh, through, uh, if they have the resources, um, and there are companies such as Celebrate, which is, is Israel-based, and, and Grayshift, which is US-based, um, to provide those capabilities to, to law enforcement. And I think the availability of those third-party devices for what is actually relatively affordable uh, price points really undermines the notion that there is any need to have a law that would mandate uh, that companies pursue uh, some guaranteed ability to access data or to uh, necessarily uh, try and compel people to unlock their phones for law enforcement, which in the US implicates our Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you, oh, yeah, so I, I'm glad you brought up Celebrite and, and, and Gray Shift. I think um, I, I'd like, maybe you can just stay on it for a minute. I, I'd like you to explain to people exactly what we know about those technologies, what they can do, um, what kind of exploits we think they're, they're using. Um, especially because you know Apple recently announced that you know uh, on its new phones it would be enabling um, USB restricted mode, which was intended to circumvent or prevent some of these types of circumventions. Um, uh, at least Grayshift has said that they can still access the phones after that, right. and so there's an interesting tension there. So maybe you can start by just give us a little more detail on, on what we know about the technology, and then Robin, we'll we'll come to you too. So these are devices that uh, fall within what we would call digital forensics, um, where you can attach this device to a phone that you want to access via what's called the lightning cable on iPhones. Um, and these devices are able to extract data from the device uh, and dump it onto it could be a CD-ROM, it could be into a database uh, for law enforcement to be able to access. Um, and you know, I'm not personally aware of exactly how, what the mechanisms are for being able to, um, to do that at scale, but one way that we do know that these devices work is basically by brute, what's called brute forcing the passcode. So if you want to open up your phone now, um, the back end is a little more complicated, but you enter your passcode and the phone unlocks. Um, how these devices work is that they can very, very, very rapidly go through all the potential combinations um, until they hit upon what the passcode is, and that opens up the phone and then 
the device is able to dump information off of it. Um, and so one trouble with these devices is that it's not just law enforcement that has them. Uh, they come onto the secondary market. There are previous uh, models of forensic devices. One of them is called IP Box, which you can buy for a couple hundred bucks off of eBay. And if law enforcement can do it, then the people who used to love stealing iPhones and stealing you know, people's data for identity theft or other purposes off of it can do that too. Um, so the fact that these devices exist out there, when Apple takes measures, as Daniel was, was mentioning, to try and figure out what flaws are being exploited or to cut down on the ability to brute force guess passcodes. Um, what Apple is doing is not really just trying to stymie law enforcement the way that it's often presented as being. It's trying to stay one step ahead in saying, if law enforcement has access to these devices, other people are going to be able to do it too. Um, and we need to be able to secure these devices and close those, those vulnerabilities uh, in order to make sure that we are still providing the best security for our users. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Ro uh, Rob, let me go to you and then, and then Mike. And I, maybe we can expand that question because the, the response from law enforcement, and I haven't heard anyone say it specifically in these terms, but uh, my interpretation of it would be they'd say, well, if you're okay with us having gray shift or, or some of these other uh, devices and you're worried about you know, uh, them being available on the black market, wouldn't it be better if we had a legislative proposal that only gave us access to this kind of technology and not someone else. But having asked a number of them this question very recently, they would also say these machines, contrary to what's been reported in the press, often don't work. They work for certain models of phones with certain operating systems. They work for some apps and not others. And I think that's a key piece that we have to keep in mind. Like, they work for a lot of things, and they do a lot of things, but the idea that Celebrate and GrayShift offer affordable solutions that give law enforcement access to any phone they plug into one of their kiosks, is that's not an accurate description. So, I mean, I think the answer is no, it would not be preferable. Um, one of the things, so when we start talking about, you know, gray shift and cell right, um, what we're talking about is government hacking. Um, and so I think first we should be backing up and sort of really diving in a little bit more to the point that Will made, which is where there are law enforcement um, offices that just have no idea what data is out there that isn't encrypted, and they have no idea how to access it. And one of the major problems that we have there is the lack of technical expertise at law enforcement agencies. Um, and one thing that nobody really considers when we're having this debate is what a turnoff the debate itself is to anyone who might otherwise want to work at the FBI who happens to be a hacker or a software engineer or a cryptographer who could help to build law enforcement's technical expertise. But the reality is when we're having a totally technically illiterate debate like we have right now, where law enforcement is just in Consistent that there is some sort of golden key that will give them this like magical access to encrypted communications, but only them and never the bad guys. No cryptographer or software engineer or hacker worth their salt wants to work with the FBI. Who, who would want to go work for an office or an agency um, that really just doesn't believe in what you do, that believes that your expertise is just wrong and that if you nerd, nerd harder, you'll figure something out. Um, and so I think the FBI is really stabbing itself in the foot um, when it is pressing on in this debate instead of acknowledging um, that it's mostly just a lack of tech expertise that can be solved by hiring more technical experts. Then I think the second thing is, okay, well, n it's not always the case that those unencrypted data are going to give you the evidence that you need, right? Sometimes you do need the, the encrypted data. And so then we get into the question of government hacking. And we've sort of like dove in head first, we ran before walking when it came to government hacking because the government just started doing it before anyone even considered whether it should be lawful. Um, and I think that what many uh, folks in the privacy and security community think, although it's not a monolith, the, so this isn't everybody, is that hacking is a better alternative to backdoors um, for many reasons, um, which we've already talked about, primarily the insecurity of encryption backdoors um, and the fact that you're just you're going to be hacking only particular endpoints or particular communications. Um, 
But the thing we haven't talked about is what does a, a legal framework for that hacking look like? Are there only certain cases where it's appropriate to engage in hacking, right? Like if you're trying to arrest someone for selling weed, maybe we shouldn't be hacking their devices um, or trying to hack into their communications in transit in order to get that evidence because it's not an important crime to be investigated. But if there is a more important crime, like those covered by the Wiretap Act, although that itself is a little controversial because it's pretty expensive these days, um, you know, then that would be appropriate. But the reality is we said, you know, wiretapping is super privacy invasive. So even though we have Calia, which says that phone companies, telecommunications providers have to be wiretappable, although there is actually an exception for encryption in that law, um, we have also acknowledged that there are very limited circumstances in which we should be able to wiretap. There are higher burdens of proof that you have to establish, including that less invasive techniques are not feasible. Um, and then there's a lot of back-end protections. We haven't figured any of those problems out for government hacking. So when we're talking about this as a really good solution, maybe it is, but we actually need to step back and slow down a little bit so that we can talk about what the privacy and civil liberties implications of that solution are um, and make sure that the law is keeping pace with the technology. Great. So so let me uh, let me Mike, pick before up. you go, I just want to let people know we're going to turn to audience questions right yeah. after this. So uh, let me pick up on uh, something that Robin said. You know, we they, we've had this idea that live wiretapping was the most invasive kind of thing that could happen to you when the government is, is capturing something from you. In fact, uh, uh, you're, if you had access to my iPhone, you might know more about me than I know about myself. I mean, there's now so much data about what I've done and where I've been and the things I've looked at that I may not remember having looked at, that you be, can, can construct a whole lot, uh, reconstruct a whole lot about me just from having access to a device. So in some sense, even though wiretapping is sometimes considered to be particularly intrusive, the fact is if you have access to uh, uh, someone's mobile device, you may be able to intrude even more. And one of the things I enjoyed about uh, uh, Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in the Carpenter case, which just came down last week, is when uh, he expressly compared the, our mobile phones to ankle monitors. They're like ankle monitors. Uh, you know, it may be that police don't have access to my iPhone this moment, but anyone who did have access to my iPhone not only knows where I've been lately, or who anyone, they also know a whole lot about me. They would also know a whole lot about where I've been because my phone has location services turned on so I don't lose my phone. Um, and and so, so these are things that I think uh, are also trend lines. We've talked about other trend lines uh, with regard to both uh, security and with regard to how governments think about this. But the other trend line is that we are increasingly wedded to uh, these technologies, whether it's secure uh, uh, information in transit for commercial transactions or private email, or also the security of the stuff that we save on our devices. And so uh, we have to think about the fact that when you do get a warrant or when you do get a, a, a court order that requires disclosure or requires government to give, or requires, pardon me, a vendor to give uh, government access to your devices or to your communications, you're actually giving over far more in some ways than you did when you had to turn over your papers or your diary or something to in, in response to a search warrant. So that's a trend line that has really shifted the balance against individual privacy and in ways that not just affect you know our own love letters and things like that, but also affect uh, 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 people who are resisting governments in more oppressive countries than this one. So these all have consequences, and one of the things that I think we have to think through, uh, in addition to the international context and in addition to the government context, is um, that we are increasingly wedded to these devices. Uh, and maybe that'll change someday in the future, but the fact is if you have access to the devices now and if you have access to our digital communications now, you may know a lot more about anybody than any law enforcement agents were ever able to gather in the past. Thank you. All right, so we have a, a mic. If you uh, raise your hand, we can bring it around. We'll do a few questions for the panel. Yep, right there in the back. I apologize, I was a little late. Um, so you all may have covered this, um, but I was going to ask kind of what your thoughts were um, with quantum computing coming up, just kind of what your thoughts are as that relates to encryption. 
Sure. Uh, so quantum computing, uh, those of you who don't know, quantum computing enables computers to do a lot of calculations uh, very fast and, and along alternative paths that may, maybe make it e a lot easier to, to brute force uh, uh, passwords and to, and to break encryption that way. Uh, and maybe not just to brute force it, but maybe even uh, in, 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 uh, accompanied by AI uh, 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 algorithms that give you the most likely paths may lead to more effective uh, computer-based uh, uh, decryption or access to encrypted devices or communications. So uh, yes, quantum computing is, is happening. It is not uh, entirely magic. I mean, it's theoretically, uh, uh, you know, you know, math, math can conceive of things that are, that are bigger than the universe. So the fact is, uh, it's certainly theoretically possible, it's certainly, it's absolutely not just theoretically possible, but practically possible that we'll have quantum computing in the near future. Uh, it is certainly true that quantum computing will give law enforcement and intelligence agencies some advantages in, 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 in beating encryption or bypassing digital security. I, I would pause before thinking it's gonna make encryption irrelevant. Uh, the fact is, uh, we can conceive of things that are bigger than quantum computers can do. Um, I was on a, a panel actually moderated by Rob, who's sitting over here um, in Toronto last month. It's still June, right? Last yes. month, um, where, where Bruce Schneier got asked this question, and his answer, which I'm going to paraphrase because he is much more technically literate than I am, um, was quantum computing is probably coming. Um, we are probably the encryption side of things is going to respond in kind. So it's not only that the offense is going to get a lot stronger, but the defense is going to get a lot stronger as well. But there will likely be a period in there that's really painful. Um, and we're going to have to respond very fast and understand how to update and get new um, either equipment or um, updated applications out very quickly in order to respond to this. And so it's planning for that, that short period where there might be a problem, but that it seems to be that these things are being developed in concert. Other questions? Thank you. Um, I know that we talked about how different systems of defense both have risks and trade-offs, um, but I just wanted to push back a little on the notion that having a vulnerability that's already built into the software just because of human flaws and not because the government mandated it would be some sort of fix. Just because the WannaCry hack like over a year ago was because of a vulnerability that was already in the system, not one that the government mandated. So I guess I was wondering, if you have a vulnerability like that, why is it any different than one that the government puts in? Even though we don't like the idea of weakening encryption, if there's a vulnerability, there's a vulnerability. So the vulnerabilities exist anyway, which is kind of where we're starting from. The problem is, is they're existing even though the technologists at these companies are doing everything within their power to not have them exist. Um, and we're already seeing things that cause global ramifications like wanna cry um, happen. When companies start being required to take resources, time, money, effort, away from keeping every single vulnerability they can find out of their system and then using those resources to build intentional vulnerabilities, not only are these are the you know, unintentional ones still going to exist, they're probably going to get a lot, there are going to be many more of them. Um, and then we're also going to have the intentional vulnerabilities that can be capitalized on and taken advantage of as well. So we're talking about making already insecure products, it's a rat race just to try to keep people secure um, and giving the people trying to break into products and devices a much greater advantage. And just real quick, I wanna reference um, a process called the vulnerabilities equities process because this is something that we desperately need to be codified into law and so it seems like a really good audience to talk about this. Um, which is a process through which the government is supposed to um, make a decision when they either discover or are told about a vulnerability, make a decision whether it is better to keep that vulnerability to themselves or disclose it to the company because the ramifications of not disclosing it could be too big. Um, there were questions about how, much, how many vulnerabilities they were keeping back from that. 
Um, I do want to flag that the gray shift um, is gray shift is kind of a loophole that they found in that it's this black box. They pretend like they've never really come into contact with the vulnerability, so they don't have to determine if they have to disclose it or not. Um, so they keep it away from themselves, and they found this this little loophole in the system. That notwithstanding, this is it's a good thing that we have the process in place. We really need to look at it a little bit harder and write it into loss because it happened, it existed before, and then it just kind of went away. It was reinvigorated after the heart bleed um, bug a few years ago, and reinvigorated again just last year, this year. Um, to keep it from going away again, it needs to be written into law. So w one thing, though, that I would, VEP versus l lawful hacking, um, I think there is a trade-off between the two, or at least there there is a, I think you have to acknowledge if you, if you are in favor of VEP, but also in favor of lawful hacking as the primary means of law, of law enforcement or the government accessing data that's otherwise encrypted and not accessible to them, the vulnerabilities equities process is about balancing equities on two sides. And the main way that, the, the main equities that they've kept in mind are traditionally, VEP was focused on vulnerabilities that were largely used by our intelligence services for foreign intelligence collection. And one of the key ways that they thought about the balance of equities was, how much does this vulnerability affect US consumers in a way that could hurt our economy, hurt our national security, hurt the civil rights of American citizens, versus how much does this have foreign intelligence value? And to the extent that law enforcement is generally concerned with monitoring activity in the United States of Americans, or at least people who are in America committing crimes, um, or there's some sort of nexus of harm to the United States, you're significantly increasing the importance to the government of having access to devices that are owned and used by Americans. And so while, in, while if in past eras, lawful hacking was largely focused on foreign intelligence collection, to some extent, you could differentiate between products and services that tended to more expose Americans versus products and services that tended to more expose, uh, vulnerabilities in products and services that more tended to expose foreign targets. You are significantly, you, you skew that balance a lot. And I think that putting the onus on the government to find vulnerabilities that exist in products and then use them to conduct surveillance within the United States and to gather data within the United States is only going to reduce the number of vulnerabilities that the government is going to feel it can disclose and should disclose given the balance of its equities. So, so I, I want to respond very briefly to that. I don't think this is a question of putting the onus on government. Like, that's the solution, government hacking. I don't think... I mean, I certainly have talked about government hacking from time to time, and I've never really said that that's the solution. Uh, uh, what what we, we want to do is say that, uh, you know, that's part of the mix. Uh, uh, in a way, wiretapping was the first instance of government hacking, uh, where they figured out a technical vulnerability and they exploited it. Uh, so, so but, but wiretapping isn't the only tool, and it wasn't the only solution for gathering information. Uh, uh, what, we're, what, what I think the more nuanced argument in favor of, of, uh, of government hacking is, is not to say that government should have the obligation to hack or to buy hacks on the, on the, on the market, uh, but that the government has the right to explore what it can lawfully do. And they may be technical hacks, and they may be other things. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, we recognize that uh, uh, law enforcement, to some extent, is dealing with moving targets. Uh, and, and we have to strike balances all along the way. But uh, I, I don't think that there's any miracle cure, just as I don't think even, uh, you know, the, the difference is that government hacking, I think, creates less mischief in terms of security than mandatory backdoors does. So we're at time. I, I know we could keep going on this, but I want to thank you for coming out today, and please join me in thanking our panelists. I'm sure we'll be back here in a year uh, doing it again. <laughs>